So you may remember this show that was on CBS for a while. Actually, the bit came from uh, Art Linkletter's show, House Party, and then they made it into its own show with Bill Cosby called Kids Say the Darndest Things. And it was just uh, basically interviews with kids saying the darndest things. I was thinking the other day that I think preachers could probably have their own show, you know, uh, Preachers Say the Goofiest Things, um, because we've got plenty of tape on us. Um, so preachers just have goofy sayings. One of those being um, when something's a little bit controversial, um, the preacher will say it like it's someone else saying it back to him. You just went from preaching to meddling. I think it's a southern thing. I don't know that I've ever heard it anywhere else and for sure never heard the word G on the end. It's not meddling, it's meddling. So um, this sermon is about to be all meddling. Uh, it's a good example, honestly, of why I believe in verse-by-verse -verse expositional preaching through the Bible because I might want to preach on this topic, but then I would be a little bit hesitant because I don't want to, to rock the boat too much. But God doesn't mind rocking our boats if it means that it makes us closer to who he wants us to be. And so we are going to talk about the government and our role in it today. And I don't know that there's a topic that's more uh, fraught with danger than this one is during this time. I mean, we are living in a, in a time where it is more divided and, and more, uh, more ugly than, than ever before. And so for a whole host of reasons, um, we've just been divided into, into two sides mainly who, who just are, are at odds. And so um, God's word's given me a, a rope today and I'm just praying that I, that I swing on it and don't hang myself, okay? So the only way to do that is to be uh, just tied to the text. What does God's word say? And so let's open it together in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13 in just a moment. So before we get there, let's just talk about the foundation that's been laid um, over the last really couple of weeks of messages here at Third Baptist. So um, in verse 9, well, even before that, Peter starts the, the whole book by calling these people that he's writing to elect exiles. But then uh, starting in verse 9, there's this list of, of phrases, of, of things that he's called the church. And so look at this list. Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, people for his possession, God's people, strangers, exiles. And so... Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've used this phrase to kind of sum up all of that, that we are the distinct people of God here to declare the glory of God, the praises of God. So we're the people of God here to declare the praises of God. If you imagine Peter's uh, arguments in this section of the book as a building, that's the foundation. And what a, what a firm foundation it is that we are the people of God of God. He is our God and we are his children. And so building on that firm foundation, let's, let's build up another wall of the Christian life today. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 13 through 17. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This is the word of the Lord whether we like it or not. So let's talk about God and government for just a moment because 
I think that, honestly, this is an area that we have not been discipled well, uh, really as Americans in particular. And so we need to make sure that we have a biblical framework to understand what the Bible says about government, all right? So we're just going to sum it up in three things, and we're going to look at a few different scriptures real quick here at the beginning, just to make sure that we have, uh, that we're all talking about the same thing and have the same understanding when we talk about government, okay? Here's the first thing. Government exists with God's authority. If you're taking notes, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. God exists, or government exists, with God's authority. Now, that may be a painful reality for you, depending on how you feel about uh, the government, but it's true. So look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities. This is the key phrase. Since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God, so then one who resists authority is opposing God's command. So Peter's saying the same thing that we just read. I mean, uh, Paul's saying the same thing as we read from Peter just a second ago, but he's fleshing it out a little bit differently. He's saying that these authorities, we should submit to them because uh, they are instituted by God. They, they exist with God's authority. And that runs super countercultural to our anti-authority world, doesn't it? I mean, and it cuts both ways. You have people on on the extremes of both sides that just absolutely hate the idea that someone else might have the right to tell them what to do. And yet it does because government exists with God's authority. The second thing, government serves God's purposes. Government exists with God's authority and it serves God's purposes. It's there for a very specific reason. Let's see what that is on down in that passage in Romans 13. Do you want to be afraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. And for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Well, that just went from preaching to meddling there at the end, didn't it? I told you it was going to happen. But the reality is that part of what it means to be a Christian is that we give Jesus the right to meddle in our lives however he chooses, right? So government authority, it, it exists with God's authority. Second, it serves uh, God's purposes. So government, look at what it said, our God's servant for our good. Doesn't always seem like that, does it? But it's true. It's better. Listen, it's better to have a flawed government than no government at all, where people are just running rampant, anarchy, doing their own thing. And now I know as we go through this message, and they're probably already starting to pop up now, there are going to be little moments where you go, yeah, but what about... And uh, I get that. I had those too when I was getting ready for this, this message. And so we'll talk about those, at least some of them, hopefully, in a little bit. Uh, but for now, just notice that the scripture doesn't put any stipulations on it. Not a, if it's a good government, if it's a bad government. It just says that it's there for God's good, uh, for God's purposes, to, for our good. When people commit a sin against another person. They rob them, they murder them, whatever the case may be. God absolutely could just strike them dead right then and there. And to be clear, one day he will judge. And just because you get punished here doesn't, doesn't take away the punishment in the future. But the primary way that he does that now is not by striking people dead. It's by using the authority that he's giving uh, civil authorities. It says right there, which if you're a, a sort of law and order kind of person, which Christians should be, there's a, there's a little bit of like, yeah, that kind of comes in my mind when I go, it does not carry the sword for no reason, right? If you do something bad, you will get in trouble. At least you should. And so government exists with God's authority and it serves God's purposes. And then the third thing just to, we have a, a biblical framework around government, is that government operates under God's sovereignty. 
Now that may be a tough pill for some of us uh, Westerners who want so badly to be uh, self-determinant. But the reality is, this is what scripture teaches. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. And then in chapter 4, verse 17, King Nebuchadnezzar talking, once he had surrendered his life to God's, to God's will, he says, this is so that the living will know that the Most High is the ruler over human kingdoms. He gives them to anyone he wants and sets the lowliest of people over them. You know what's funny? I've never heard a politician say that that was their favorite verse when they get asked that question. How does... How does that work with nations taking over other nations and with voting in our case? Um, Well, just like all of Scripture, God uses sinful people to accomplish His eternal purposes. That's true all over the Bible, and it's true still in our case. It wasn't too long after uh, after that Scripture where uh, the the kingdom was taken away from King Nebuchadnezzar and given it to Belshazzar, who then... uh, saw the writing on the wall and the kingdom went to King Darius. And so God was doing it then and God still is in control of the kingdom. And people of God, that should give you a tremendous amount of hope. It gives us hope to know that the God that we serve, who we call Father, is in control of all things. He has not lost control, not now, nor will he on November 3rd of this year and on January 20th of next year in 21, no matter who is in the White House, Jesus will still be on the throne. Amen. God is still in control. So uh, what's a a biblical view of government look like? Well, there's a lot of books written and, and we could spend a long time there, but we're just summing it up in these three things this morning. It exists with God's authority. It serves God's purposes and it operates under God's sovereignty. So now, with that said, let's get back to our text in 1 Peter. Um, We're going to talk about this idea of submission. So followers of Jesus Christ, the people of God, distinct from the world, we're a holy nation all of our own, we have verses like Philippians 3.20 to, to encourage us in that. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then how are we, as citizens of this eternal kingdom, to operate in the kingdoms of the world which we find ourselves now? Well, let's start by looking at the very first verse that we read in 1 Peter, verse 13. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord. So submit because of the Lord. Parents, you remember when your children were in the why stage? I mean, everything you said, it's why, 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 why? It eventually ends in because I said so. That's why, or the, maybe the more sanctified version, because God made it that way, right? So I love that the Bible, not all the time, but most of the time, it gives us the why for people who never outgrew that stage. So God's not just out there making arbitrary rules for no reason. They're for our good and for his glory. And most of the time, he'll give us the reason why. And so right here, you have what we're supposed to do, uh, submit, and you have the why, because of the Lord. And the why is super, super important here. So this submission is a, usually a military term. It means, you know, kind of the idea of rank, that you would submit yourself to your superior officers. And so what was the first thing that we said about government? It exists with God's authority, right? And so your act of submission to the human authorities, to the government, to the laws of the land, is an, actually an act of submission to God and his authority because he's the one who put those authorities in place. And notice that it even goes further. By the time we get to the end of this, in verse 17, it's saying to honor everyone and to honor the emperor, the king. That's hard. The only reason that, we'll, the only reason that we would do that sometimes is because of the Lord. Notice that it, it, it goes deeper than just the superficial 
the superficial submission to the heart because God is always after our heart, always. Not just the superficial obedience, but the obedience of the heart. It's not based on your personal preference, political ideology, dislike of the person. None of that is involved in this. It just simply says to submit. Now, we don't have kings or emperors in our, in our system of government, but I think because it says, you know, emperor and then governors and then on down, that we can apply this really from the local level on up. So mayors and, and county officials. In fact, um, at, at the service, I, Greg was sitting there in the back, and I said, okay, Greg, if you, if you're, uh, you heard me say it, the next time I do a marriage ceremony, I'm going to take that certificate, fill it out correctly, and bring it to you because of the Lord to submit to God and submit to your authority that he has given you as the county clerk. It, we, we honor and we submit to those authorities around us from the local level on up. So for us here in this part of Southern Illinois, that means uh, these verses absolutely apply to Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth and Mike Bost, our senators and representative here in this part of the area. And while we may not have kings or emperors, um, for sure the closest thing that our system of government has would be uh, Governor Pritzker and President Trump. Both of those are like the, they're the executives of the branches of, of government and so, or the, the, the parts of government. And so um, these verses absolutely apply to both of those men. Now, as I was saying that, probably at least one of those names, maybe multiple, maybe all of them, made you kind of, you know, have a, a involuntary twitch uh, in your heart, if not externally. And... To be quite honest, that's probably the best indicator of who you really needed to hear this message about. It's easy to submit to people who we agree with, isn't it? It's a lot harder to show honor, not just on the surface level, but in our hearts for those who we do not agree with. However bad you think our government may be, how any of those, however bad any of those people might be, just remember who we're, this this scripture was originally written to when he says honor the emperor he's talking about emperor nero and i don't know how things are pretty bad sometimes in springfield or dc but i'm pretty sure they're not lighting the streets with christian candles and i don't mean you know nice smelling candles with a pithy scripture on the front i mean coat, coat people in tar and set them on fire we're not quite to that level yet and so i mean we talk about the cross of christ all the time but Crucifixion was just part of Roman culture in a place where they occupied. If you rebelled, one, one time they, uh, they crucified 6,000 people along the road leading outside of Rome. Can you imagine driving from, from here to north of, north of Effingham and every 100 feet there's another person dead or dying on a cross? That'll get your attention. And it's that government and that emperor that this passage is telling these Christians to honor and to submit to. So I think that probably takes away all of our excuses. There's only one way that you and I are going to be able to do that. And that is if our motivation comes from the Lord and not from the people, not from the government. We willingly submit ourselves because of the Lord because we're doing it for his sake, not for their sake. And so the first part is submit because of the Lord. Now let's look at verse 16 again for kind of the second point in this part of the message. First is to submit because of the Lord. The second is here in verse 16. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. So we are to submit as free people. So if submit because of the Lord was the what and the why, this is the what and the how. How are we supposed to do that? We're part of the kingdom of God. We are the only people in the whole world who are really truly free, right? Jesus said himself, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So part of the glory 
of being a part of this kingdom is that we are free. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we are also slaves to God. Did you catch that? That we're to submit as free people as God's slaves. That's kind of a, a weird juxtaposition, isn't it? Except when you think about it, we're slaves because he has the right to tell us what to do, where to go, and what to say. And yet, the, the glorious freedom that we have is he also has given us a new heart and changed our, our affections and our thoughts towards him so that we want to do the very things that he's called us to do. So the, the people of God then, we submit ourselves to the authorities, but we do it as free people who are willingly choosing out of our own free will to do it, not out of force like the rest of the world. The rest of the world may submit, but they'll do it because they'll get in trouble. They'll go to jail. They'll get fined if they, if they don't. We do it because we're worshiping Jesus, because we're, we're serving the God who gave those people the authority. And so we submit ourselves because of his authority that he then has given to them. See, that attitude, that approach to life in, in culture, in the, in the government, it allows us to, to still participate in civic life, to fight for the rights of the unborn and for those who are, uh, don't have a voice. And yet, and yet, we still maintain our distinctiveness as the people of God in the world. The people of God are a nation, an ethnicity all of our own, but it's a holy nation, it says there in verse 9. A royal priesthood and a holy nation, which means obedience. That's what being holy is about. And whenever is possible, we submit ourselves to those who are in authority. So, real life application for us then, in Illinois, or where, whatever state you may be in, in the United States of America in 2020. So I said earlier that this is probably the most, it's probably the most um, divided that our, our people have ever been before. I mean, the combination of 24 seven news and social media that only shows you things that you will like, when the reality is you kind of need to see things that you don't like to have a broad overview of the world. It's just gotten us to this place that is very, very ugly. And so let me just say this. If, if you feel uncomfortable as a Christian in this current climate that we're in, as your pastor, let me just tell you that that is a really good sign. I mean, that makes me happy. Not that you're uncomfortable because it's uncomfortable. But Christians shouldn't be comfortable in listening to the just downright evil hatred that people have for one another right now. It should make us uncomfortable. Knowing that I was going to preach this, I saw on Facebook last week a, a, uh, a post from the Anne campaign that kind of hit me right between the eyes. Uh, it said this, I'll put it up on the screen. On social media, there's no greater joy than seeing our political opponents in a humiliating situation. What does that say about us? It can't be healthy. And I just kind of sat back in my seat and went, wow, that's true and it's concerning. We are going to have to be very, very intentional in this time to honor everyone, to follow the commands that our king has given us during this time. So let's, let's break it down. There's a, a few very practical ways that we can do that. Um, the first one, we don't call people derogatory names. Now, I know that may seem like just a, a small thing, but it gets at the, at the attitudes that are going on. So we have just devolved into this culture of name calling and insults that is about as far away from these verses as you could possibly get. Here's the deal. I like wordplay and I like puns and I like satire and sarcasm. And the combination of those things um, is often used in, in these, these names. And so, um, for instance, we have two presidential candidates right now that are calling each other Sleepy Joe and President Tweety. And while those are harmless, and you can see by my smile, I actually think they're kind of funny, um, uh, there's a lot of other names that are being thrown about that are a lot less 
funny. In fact, they're hurtful and that's the goal. You should think the next time you hear people calling each other by derogatory um, nicknames, think to yourself, this is what they're trying to get me to do. They're trying to get me to dehumanize this person so that I don't think of them as a, a person made in the image of God, uh, but I think of them instead of as an idea that must be destroyed at all costs, right? That's kind of the idea. You know, I spent years listening to, to talk radio on the AM dial um, in, in the car, and a lot of that is based on this name calling. I remember at one point when I was a you know, teenager that had just started listening to it, actually Googling, who is Slick Willie? Because <laughs> I didn't know. And so it's, it's just a reality. You find it everywhere now where, where we're just referring to other people, not honoring at all by these derogatory nicknames. We teach our kids not to call people names, right? We call it bullying. And when we do it as adults, it looks even more childish because we ought to know better. The royal priesthood, children of the king, should not stoop to calling people names. Here's another thing. We don't spread half-truths. A half-truth is a whole lie. If a person has a five-minute uh, speech about something, and it's a nuanced argument. Even if you think that their argument is wrong, even if it is wrong, if you take five seconds out of that clip, and you may not be the one doing it, but you're sharing it all about, that's called false witness. Full stop. It's a sin. Because what you're doing in that moment is misrepresenting what they were saying in order to make them look bad or to make yourself or your opinion look good. And yet it's become acceptable in our culture, not, our, not just our culture at large, because we shouldn't be surprised when, when people who are not following Christ act in sinful ways, right? We were there once as well. But even in our Christian culture, it's not even accepted as it is expected. And heaven help you if you try to call out someone uh, for, for their misrepresentation of another. And quite honestly, this has got to stop. I mean, Christians are about the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what our King Jesus said. And when we participate in such nonsense, we're actively rebelling against what he's told us to do, and we're bringing we're bringing shame upon his name. You think about a person, and I'm just going to, I'll say you, not assuming that you would do this, but let's just play out the example. A person who knows that you're a Christian and who has seen the whole five minute clip that I was talking about. When they see you share that five second clip that clearly misrepresents what that person was trying to say, then subconsciously and maybe even consciously, they'll go, huh, I guess. What everybody else says is true. Christians really are just all about getting political power no matter the cost. None of us actually believe that. But when we share half-truths and whole lies, that's what the world sees and they're right. And so we have to stop that. We, we share truth. Listen, the people of God have the truth on their side. We do not need to resort to lies. Here's the third thing. We go out of our way to preserve family unity. So look at the difference here in this passage between the two points in this rapid fire commands in verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters. There's a difference between those two things. We show honor to everyone because they are made in the image of God. But we treat Christians differently because they're part of the family of God. There should be a difference in how we approach these things, even with unbelievers and believers. What binds us together is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and what God has joined together, let no man separate. The kingdom of God is my number one allegiance, more than political ideology, more than party, more than even national identity, because this is a kingdom that spans all time and all places, all nations. A, a holy people, a people for his own 
possession. And so here's what I think it means in our caustic culture right now. You talk to people, not on public Facebook posts. I'm talking you have conversations in private. If you, ha- if you know that they disagree with you on some topic, um, talk with them with your Bibles open because it really matters what God says more than it matters what either one of you say. And if you're talking about an issue that the Bible does not address, which is a lot of things in politics, two things I would say about that. The first of, first of which is that you should not divide over that thing. Listen, if our Heavenly Father did not deem it important enough to include in His Word, then His children should not separate and, and argue over those things. We can have a discussion about it. But if God's word is not clear, then it's a matter of Christian liberty. The second thing is this. If you're talking about an issue where the Bible doesn't doesn't say anything clearly, then maybe you should just keep your Bible open to this passage in Ephesians. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Man, we need that verse lived out right now more than ever through these next four months if we would just follow these verses we would be a light to a dark world humility gentleness patience bear with one another make every effort to keep unity that's what god's called us to do and so we go out of our way to maintain family unity in the family of god even when the the whole world around us is all on two sides. Here's the, the fourth thing. We understand and remember that we are outsiders. If you follow these five verses that we've looked at in 1 Peter today, a lot of people will be unhappy with you. You won't fit in because you won't be participating in dishonoring President Trump And you won't participate in dishonoring Governor Pritzker. And so, you know, just apply that on out for every other person. If you follow these verses in 1 Peter, you'll feel very quickly like an exile and a stranger. Imagine that. The last verses before these. I said two weeks ago that I believe part of the reason that the Western church You know, church in America is in the state that it's in is because we have lost our distinctiveness as the people of God. When it comes to this issue of our interaction with government, and especially this year, we have a tremendous opportunity, family, to gain back some of that distinctiveness, this otherworldliness that we've lost. When we refuse to participate in those things that I was just saying, the dehumanizing of image bearers of God by calling them names just because they share a different opinion than us. When we refuse to, and and even more than refuse, call out especially other Christians who are sharing half-truths and whole lies, then a world will go, huh, they really do care about the truth. When we argue for right policy without wrong attitudes. Listen, you automatically lose the argument if you get all bent out of shape. Right? We argue for right policy with the right attitude. When we strive for love and unity in the body of Christ, even when we disagree on secondary issues, we say no. We, we begin and end every conversation with brother, sister, family of God who should not be divided by these things. And when we live in submission, and not just submission on an outside, but inward submission and honor to the government authorities that God has put in place over us instead of the division and hatred, then the world will look at the church again and go, wow, those people are different. We will be distinct from the world if we will just follow these verses always, but in particular in the next four or five months. That's when the world will notice 
that Jesus has changed us, that we really are a peculiar people, like the King James translates that verse. And not only that, they'll be more likely to, be, more likely to believe us when we declare the glory of the God that we serve. And so, like this last verse says in our text today, honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God above all, and honor the king.